if you just treat it like, well, it's just my vacation home and I rent it part time, it's it's going to be a little struggle. You probably won't do as well and uh, probably cause you more headache. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Chris and Ashton Lavera. How are you guys doing today? Great. Thank you, Todd. Great to be here. Good. Good. Absolutely. Uh, Valkyrie. Uh, so t- tell me a little bit about you guys. Why don't you, I don't know, Ashton, hit it off. Like, what's what's going on? What What's so special about you guys? Uh, well, our mom thinks that we're really special. Oh, don't, our um, mom's amazing. Like my mom <laughs> thinks I've got the most amazing singing voice ever. Let's just say it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the best part. My, my wife hates it how much my mom supports us, but, um, I think, uh, okay. So in a nutshell, um, 21 years in the military, uh, started investing in real estate in 2018 with Chris, um, kind of as a response to getting out of the military. Um, and then we got into apartment syndications and then syndicating portfolios of Airbnbs uh, or vacation rentals. And now we teach other people to how to get their first or second vacation rental and walk away from their W-2 forever. So um, were you guys? So both... that's 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that was quick. Were you guys both in the military for that long? No, okay okay yeah. did you so ashton you you were in the military for did you say 21 years i did yeah awesome that From is 1998 till 2020 2020 actually okay. although there was a break in there but yeah. and did you start investing in real estate prior to getting out of the military or was that you got out and you're like hey this is what i'm doing yeah, I was still very much um, in it, deploying and everything um, in 2018 when we started. I didn't retire until 2020. Okay. So you, yeah. so you got a, a little bit of a start, 2018, starting that real estate journey. And you're buying short-term rentals. Is that all you guys have, have been buying the whole time? Apartment complexes, actually. That's oh. where we started. We started in small multifamily and, got, and went into uh, larger syndications of large multifamily. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so you started in small, what, what, what's like, what's, what's your first deal? Chris, are you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah. Our first deal was uh, two duplexes in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, Ashton was in fate. Well, he was in Pinehurst, North Carolina. It was about two hours, almost three hours south of that. But uh, I was in Phoenix, Arizona. We decided to re- invest remotely. So we bought these 1948, 1940s, um, two duplexes, pretty run down in Old Durham, they call it. And it's kind of a gentrifying area uh, where you can get some cheaper property <laughs> at a discount, but you you pay for it. Um, but we got, yeah, $209,000 was all we needed to buy two duplexes, about 1,400 square foot each property. So it was good. That launched us in and uh, we renovated them, refinanced them, rented them out. And um, yeah, that was the start of our journey. So you got those two, you said, yeah, this is, this works, right? We got them for cheap. It, it worked. And um, where'd you go from there? About the, about those two refied, what, where'd you go? What'd you start doing? Uh, we did that. <clears throat> we did another duplex and another duplex. So two more duplexes in that area. And then we did a five unit in a nearby city, Burlington in North Carolina. And we did a 13 unit and a 16 unit in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, We syndicated one of those. The rest were really just joint ventures, private lenders, partnerships. Uh, Then we partnered with a bigger syndicator group and we did bigger properties, 84 unit, 120 unit. Um, And then we kind of scaled up from there and uh, partnerships became the key. Love it. When you started to scale up, were were you guys uh, on the capital side? Were you on the um, asset management side? Like, how how did you get in the corridor? I always like to ask people that just like start going bigger really quick. Like, what mm-hmm. it, what did you do? Because I think that's a big challenge for a lot of people. Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. 
Amy. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big challenge. And I think, um, you know, what's key for people is one of the things that we did that really helped us was figure out what we want to do, right? There's yeah. so many aspects of real estate you want to, you can do, but if you try to do them all, you will not scale. Um, you'll probably burn out and probably fail. Um, but we identified real quick that like, there's one thing that everybody has starting out and that's a network. Um, and if you can leverage your network, right, whatever, whatever that may be, friends, family, coworkers, whatever, you can leverage that network to bring and add value to other teams, which allows you to scale much faster. Um, and so we focus on the capital raising side initially, uh, because every deal we've done has always been with other partners that have helped bring the capital. We may have bring, you know, the asset management, the fi finding the property, all that. But, you know, we found that the capital raising was the easiest because that's something that is something we all have starting off. Like we don't, so if we want to go do a hundred, 200, 300 unit apartment complex, and we've only done the biggest one we've only done is a 16 unit, which that's, that was the case. We need to partner with people that have more credibility that can do that kind of stuff. So that's what we, that's where we started. So yeah, we were raising capital uh, initially for these bigger deals. And that's, that's where we are today. We continue to raise capital for large, um, deals, large projects around the country, mostly along the Sun Belt um, in America. But yeah, uh, typically capital raising, although we've shifted a little bit because what we found is a lot of people starting out, they want to get into this business, but they can't create the cash flow to help them replace their W-2 fast enough. And yeah. so when we discovered vacation rentals, I don't know, last year or the year prior, um, that was a huge, you know, that was something huge for us because initially we just wanted to get what 20 doors each that cash flow at $500 each. Um, but you could do that with one to two vacation rentals and all of a sudden your day opens up, your ability to scale opens up, um, because now you have that financial platform, you know, that cash flow that provides you that freedom to build and scale your business, which, you know, it took us what, three years to retire ourselves, uh, essentially <laughs> from W2s. But um, yeah, with a vacation rental, you can do it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's huge for for listeners to understand. Like, look, you're buying a 200 unit or 100 unit, 80, you said 84 and 120 um, unit. Look, you don't have to do it all on your own. And to come in and figure out what, hey, what what can we bring to the table? You guys brought your network into the, that helped you get in the corridor, right? Maybe it's maybe it's finding the deal, maybe it's bringing that deal to the table. Maybe it's maybe it's the the underwriting, the asset management. But but it doesn't matter. You've you understand that you if you're going to take a big deal like that down, you guys understood very quickly. We need the expertise. We need somebody that people that have already the system set up let's lean on them. Let's bring what we can bring to the table. Let's lean on them and learn from them. So I, I think that's super, super valuable. So are you still focused a lot on multifamily? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, we do both. So we do uh, prim primarily we're fund managers for multifamily. So we go find private equity, uh, find capital in the multifamily space. Cause it's a great stable asset. People are running it. It's not going anywhere. Um, and it does does quite well on the value add or the profit from sale on the back end. But we do the vacation rentals for the cash flow piece, and then we also teach it. Uh, so we started teaching and coaching on it, which is part of it, mainly because of a lot of our network seems to be sophisticated, uh, and we didn't really have an offer for them necessarily all the time. We do a lot of credited, and so we began offering here. You can go do it yourself. Here you can go learn how to do it if you want to do it, um, or you can invest with us. You know we do have occasional sophisticated offerings, but we do a mixture of multifamily and short-term rentals. Love it. Short-term. Let's let's shift and talk a little bit about short-term rentals. Short-term rentals. Are you guys still able to buy and, and find good short-term rentals? That it feels like a market, or at least you hear about the market being oversaturated. Although multifamily, you hear the same thing. Um, so you hear about it being oversaturated. Is there opportunity still to be buying short-term rentals and, uh, we can dive into what you look for. Yes. And no, <laughs> it depends, right? Cause, uh, I think Chris, you did a blog the other day. It was about this, how markets are not all markets are the same, right? Yeah. Like if you're trying to buy a short-term rental in Maui or New York or, um, LA, the, the benefits or the ROIs are going to be totally different than if you were to buy it in, say, 
I don't know. I always like this one because it was it was crazy to find out. But like the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska is one of the top performing vacation rental markets in the U.S. Wow. right now. So and and Chris can talk to this really well. But a lot of it has to do with the purchase price versus the cash flow, right? The purchase price price of a home in Maui is going to be one to two million. You know, something yeah. like a nice one, right? And then what's the cash flow on that? You're going to make a lot in, a lot of gross, but the expense is going to be huge and that's going to eat into your profits. Um, so is it oversaturated? Sure. It is probably in some of these markets, but in other markets, in tertiary markets where the purchase price is much lower and the expenses are much lower, you can have a hundred percent return on investment in year one, year two, you know? Um, I mean, look at it like the average price in the Kenai Peninsula is, I think it was like 150,000. So 20% down to buy a $150,000 home. And then the income was around 54,000. Wow. So to do the math, like that's really freaking good. Yeah. So it just depends. It depends where you're buying. I, I can't imagine you just can go to any cheap market and be successful though, right? No. I mean, you can't just, I can't just pick like, hey, Cleveland, I can, I'm going to buy and maybe, and maybe Cleveland's a bad, bad. Actually, uh, Ohio's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, maybe Cleveland's an amazing market and you should invest there, but yeah. um you can't just go, Hey, uh, that market, you know, I can buy a house for 80 or a hundred thousand dollars. Let's just buy them and vacation rental. Like, what do you, what are you looking for in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's usually four or five categories that you look for. So obviously the one everyone sticks out is the policy that people are like, Oh, well, what mm -hmm. if government changes policy, state changes right. policy. So that's always one of the criteria they're going to look for. Um, but you're looking for what Ashton just said, is it going to make money? So is it going to be profitable? And that typically has to do with what are you spending to acquire it versus what it can get to gain, you know, what it can um, generate as income. Yeah. And you're going to look at traffic, right? Like how many people are visiting the area or need to go to that area? Uh, if you just pick some random middle of the desert area, is anybody actually going there? You know, are they going to stay? It, it is hospitality, right? So people are, you know, you want people to visit your property. Um, but you look at like the same kind of thing in multifamily too. So that that idea of landlord friendly insurance taxes, is it useful there um, or does it work where you're going at? Um, and then what's the other one? You know, I'm trying to think of the different ones. Seasonality is another big one in short term rental space. Uh, so that's not multifamily, you know, similar, but you're thinking about, OK, well, if I buy a property on the beach and it's only booked, you know, one part of the year. Uh, better hope that covers the rest of the expenses for the rest of the year. So those are just some of the criteria you might look at. And, and typically there's, you know, platforms that will give you this data and they'll rank it based mm -hmm. on those criteria. So then you can, you can just go, Oh, well, I'll only take the a class markets or something like that. So that's simplifies it. Yeah. And, and then you guys yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, and you know, something we, we skipped over because we, get asked this a lot actually we're we're in a fund right now where we're we're using our fund to buy 160 vacation rentals across the u.s this year so we get asked this a lot both from investors and people that want to go buy their own um but if you look at the data i mean vacation rental demand has gone up 20 percent per year since 2019 now 2020 there was a dip obviously because of covid um and there was a slowdown in traffic all that stuff but it picked right back up after everything started opening back up and so that's 20% per year, right? Um, and then if you look at the overall availability, or I forget the correct term for it, um, supply, the supply of, of available vacation rentals, that's only grown, was it like 14 to 16% since 2019? Not per year, since 2019. Total. So okay. the supply is not keeping up with the demand. Um, now that's not to say, like you said, not every market is going to be a home run. Not every market is going to be a great, uh, market. And even if you are in a great market, like how are you going to maximize profitability, right? There are certain ways to do that, um, both to streamline your management so that you can spend less time actually managing it, but yeah. also to increase profitability. Um, and this is very different from apartment complexes where it's kind of a, you put a renter in there, he signs a 12 month lease and you just make sure you check up on the place every few months. You know, this is different. You're, it's every week. Um, but there are ways you can do this. There are ways you can streamline it. There's ways you can free this up. And I know a lot of us want to focus on passive income. Now this isn't passive if you are managing it, but I mean, it's a lot more passive than say your W2 where you have to go from nine to five 
or where you have to, you know, go out and find properties constantly. Like you, one to two Airbnbs in a good market uh, can consistently gross, you know, 100, 200,000 a year and net 50 to 100,000 a year. So these aren't numbers we make up. These are numbers we actually see. Um, and you can go on MASH Pfizer, you can go on AirDNA, you can find, and you'll see those numbers replicated there. Um, and we, that's what we recommend to people. If you don't believe us, go check it out. You can look up a lot of this stuff. I mean, this is all free information out there right now. So, I mean, you're, you're looking at a fund where you're buying 160. Is that what you said? 160? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, we're like, we're partnered with some other guys. Yeah. That's a lot of management on, mm -hmm. on that. That's one of the biggest things I get concerned about when I look at, man, I got a lot going on. Right. I like the idea of buying a vacation rental, but I got a lot going on. And is this just a distraction? And how are we going to manage this thing? Especially because it's probably not going to be in my own backyard. Maybe it is, but probably not going to be in my own backyard. So what like what the heck? How do you manage a hundred and sixty scattered site vacation rental properties or short term rental properties? Yeah, that's a great question. You need to have systems, right? You need to have automations. You need to have the faculty. You need to have manpower, of course, but you can automate a lot of things. Um, we, we manage six from Arizona and we're not near them necessarily. So um, our, our partner is the operator system or the vertical management in this scenario. And we're partnering with them on these 160 units, but how do they do it really? It's the same way we manage ours, it's having those automatic templates for when people check in, uh, the digital codes that automatically update based on someone's date arriving. The uh, you know, and and then they even have stuff now where it finds the mobile number of the person who bought the the you know the desk the vacation, and it makes that the code automatically on the digital code at the property without the person ever doing anything. Um, so you got auto, all these temperature gauges that, that change automatically, the codes change automatically, the emails that go out automatically. And really the, the thing that the person has to get involved with is simply the inquiries or if there's issues. And so you can actually right. have one person managing roughly, you know, six six properties and do fairly okay if they have the right systems with, with that uh, program. Uh, and additionally, what you'll have is like databases, right? So like that's that's important too. So all the information for the property is stored one central location that your VA or your person can simply look at and go, oh, well, the property, you know, they see the pictures of the property, the interior of the property, you know, you have that all stored in a database. They can be like, oh, yeah, the TV remote should be on by the fireplace, you know, and you can see that kind of stuff. You know, think about like Matterport uh, with, with like multifamily um and property scans, or uh, you can do all that in a short-term rental and keep that information all stored in the cloud. So your system or your VA can actually check that. Uh, so most people won't do that. And so they'll be stuck at the one to two properties or even two to four properties, and they might feel overwhelmed. But if you build a system and if you build a database of information uh, or even a decision tree that your VA knows how to respond to certain inquiries, and this guy's doing AI now where the, the AI will respond to certain inquiries with certain responses mm -hmm. based on the wording used in the question. Wow. Um, so if you can get really, you can, if you make it like a business, you get a lot of time freedom back. But if you just treat it like, well, it's just my vacation home and I rent it part time, it's, it's going to be a little struggle. You probably won't do as well and uh, probably cause you more headache, but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like anything, right any kind of business, if you want to do well with it, systematize it. If yeah. you want to struggle yeah. with it, if you want to get pissed off about it, then don't <laughs> like just yeah. do it all. Try to do it all yourself. Yeah, and then, totally. and then you show up to the uh, family reunion. You're like, Oh, I tried that once. That's a yeah. terrible thing. Real estate, yeah. ah, it's tenants, toilets, and trash. Right. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. We hear that all the time. True. <laughs> Don't you? I mean, I hear it all the time. Oh, my uncle did that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sure they did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, financing. How do you get financing out of state? You, you know, you guys are buying in different locations all over. How are you getting financing for these things? You know, you're talking about buying something in, in Alaska or Arizona, you know, how are you getting financing for something like that? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. That's, that's probably one of the big, the most common questions, uh, especially with new people, right? They don't understand that 
there are people out there that are willing to loan on products like this or be partners on products like this, so long as you're offering a good return. Now, of course, there's the, always the tried and true, the banks, um, you know, hard money lenders, there's lines of credit, there's home equity lines of credit, there's loans against your whole life insurance policies. Like this is where people get, how they get started. That's And I'm just addressing this because a lot of people say, where do I get the money to start? But then the financing itself, um, we typically use like a hard money loan to start to buy it because we like to buy value add properties. Um, and then you refinance into a DSCR loan. Now, everybody that's ever been in commercial space and commercial real estate understands a debt service coverage ratio loan is simply a loan that's based off the net operating income. So based on how much they think that property will make per year, will qualify or disqualify you for a loan. So you can kind of, it's your last check and balance before you make an offer on that property, probably. If you look at a, a property bank? and let's say you go to, they're, no, they're national banks. Not all of them work in all um, states. So like, I think like Vizio only just opened up to um, Arizona, but like there are, there are these DSCR loans that are available all across the U S because vacation rentals have become a, a very profitable uh, investment for both the user and of course banks. Um, and they basically look at what the rest of the vacation rentals in that area with, with like kind or like, um, square footage and rooms and all that, what they make per year. And they say, is that going to cover the debt? 1.25 times that, you know, is the cash flow going to be 1.25 times the debt? Mm. Um, maybe some are more conservative, maybe some are more, you know, relaxed, but that's typically where it starts. And then, you know, they give you a loan on based on the income, the net operating income of that, the potential net operating income of that property you're trying to buy. And that's good to know because then, you know, you can buy a value add really quickly. You can buy a three bedroom, turn it into a four or a five, and then get the loan for the four or five. And that's the refinance to get your capital back to pay the hard money lender. So, could, um, could, so could there's you, a bunch of ways that, to do it. In that scenario, then would you be able to get in with no money in that scenario? Or are these banks pretty, are they paying attention to what you bought it for originally and only lending 80% of what you purchased it for? No, not usually. And Chris talks more, knows a little bit more about this. He's usually in securing the loans, but um, again, they're not going off of your purchase price. Although you are, you're still going to get an appraisal. Yeah, um, right. Right. Yeah. But, but if and I, not, let's say I bought it for 150,000, I put 20,000 into it. Could I, could I get a loan for, you know, if I bought it for 150, put 20, could I get a loan for $170,000 after you know, I got a hard money loan, did that. Maybe, maybe got another $10,000 worth of costs. Uh, so 180 grand. Could I get $180,000 loan in six months after buying it? You're going to, you can do a loan to cost with the hard money lender for 90%. Like we yep. did that on two of them. So mm -hmm. you're putting 10% loan to cost down. You can do that. Typically they want to see experience flipping or renovating of some kind though, if they're going to do that. Yep. But then the traditional method where you're just going straight in with the bank, um, they're going to do more that buy at the uh, 25% down range is, is usually what they're going to do right now with the market, 75% LTV. Um, and then it was even around like the 65, 70% LTV a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So it just, it depends. Like you could do an all cash purchase though, and, and do it the same way as if you were going to burr a deal or, or yeah. you could buy it all cash and then, yeah, renovate out of it if you wanted to do that. So yeah. Um, yeah. it depends the buy box. Yeah, right. And and then you're saying the other thing that you guys are do, doing or seeing done is that you say, hey, I got this vacation rental. You get some some private money into it, and there you're just giving them a return, and you're buying it yep. essentially cash with that private money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You could well, do that. Yeah, but it's you can syndicate it bank. essentially, or syndicate. It's not a real syndication, but you could bring multiple partners in, and, and all of a sudden, it's like a timeshare that you manage. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, everybody gets a portion of the returns and gets to use it throughout the year. We've done that as well. Yeah, man, lots of options. What are you guys excited about today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're really excited to be launching that that course and that coaching program. We we sold our course a couple of times already, and um, we realized people need a little more accountability, a little more help. So we added a uh, 90 day sprint to it with coaching and um, talking a lot about that. It's exciting to do something different. We've been raising private equity for the last five years. So it's exciting to kind of like dabble in the education space 
and have something to offer also someone who's, you know, maybe in the hundred thousand dollar salary range, but really can't invest fifty thousand dollars at the drop of a dime with a syndication group. So it's exciting to do something different in that regard and also build a funnel and like record all the content. It's it's kind of fun. So that's cool. It's exciting to see other people get started, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah you know, everybody wants financial freedom and let's, let's be clear about something else. I think this is interesting. Um, I feel like the regular workplace is going away. So people that have a real job that they go in nine to five, they show up every day. You know, that's going away. Like McDonald's has already created a fully automated restaurant. You know, if we call McDonald's a restaurant. Um, but like, I feel like the physical, you know, people showing up for a physical job is like next couple decades you're going to see less and less than that and i and it became apparent in 2020 and so this whole thing that you have to be there on site to manage your property to live where you invest you know like that helping people get around that and all of a sudden be stay at home parents or or you know world travelers that manage their airbnbs vacation rentals around the world and no longer need a physical w2 i think that's a lot of fun and talking to these people as they get into it like us, our method was really slow. Like I said, we wanted to get 40 properties um, before we could retire. But when you show people how you can do in one, just one to two properties, like, I mean, the tech is there, the, the virtual assistants are there, the everything's, I mean, the systems and automations, all the, I mean, you really don't even have to do much anymore. The analysis, analyzing properties is done by a lot of these sites now. Um, the apps that you can use to manage it, make it so much easier. And you're just opening the door for people to, uh, create a whole new life, you know, um, instead of waiting for retirement It's really, and it's fun. It's cool. We're moving to Costa Rica. We're, we're actually doing it. I've been talking about this so much that finally I looked at my wife and I was like, why are we living in Oregon still? Why don't we go somewhere else? And we just kind of started thinking about it. Like we love Costa Rica. Let's go move to Costa Rica. And sure enough, we just got back from Costa Rica last week, uh, put a couple offers in a house on house, but it's because of this, because you can do this kind of stuff with a business, with a real estate investment. So goodbye, um, Oregon. Hello, Costa Rica. Yeah. I, yeah, love, yeah. I love that. That's great. <laughs> um, I got, I got a question. This is a selfish question. Um, I've got a lot of rental houses and I don't really love them anymore. That's how, <laughs> that's how I got my start, but there's some of them I feel like could be in a decent look. Like, how do you determine, how do you go? If I've got a current long-term rental, and this is, it's been like this forever. How do you, how do you determine if that would be a good short-term rental property? Is it just yeah. kind of, I mean, I, you already kind of talked about it. Visitors to the area is, is I mean, is it the same? We could, I mean, we could walk, walk you through our, our process if you want. Um, and you've probably already done some of this. So no. you've, I, the market has, well, you've already identified the market. Those, those sure. properties are in a market, right? Yeah. So now you just have to figure out if that market is profitable Yeah. and you can use mash Pfizer, you can use air DNA to look those numbers up. Huh. Um, and what Chris was saying earlier is absolutely holds true, but like now you're not necessarily looking at population growth and job growth and rent growth. Instead, you're looking at, um, you are, you're looking at like, occupancy rates versus average daily rates versus purchase price of the home. Although you already have the home. So maybe you would weigh that against how much equity you have in the home. Um, and so then you would determine, and Chris uses a really cool rule of thumb. He taught me actually was, uh, how's it go, Chris, you do, um, purchase yeah. price or invested capital revenue but, divided by purchase price. So there he is. Uh, yeah. Typically air DNA is going to Airdina is a good one. Mash Pfizer, like you said, there's a couple out there. You can pay like anywhere from 30 to 100 bucks for a month, depending on how much data you want to see. And then you'll get data for your market. And uh, Airdina will even grade your market, kind of like I talked about on those different things, rental demand, rental growth, all that kind of stuff. And so if you go, okay, I do want to do this, then you'll, you can enter in an address, your address, for example, and they'll give you an output of uh, what that property might make based on existing listings. And so a good rule of thumb is you just take that projected revenue and you divide it by the purchase price. And then you're going to get a, a percentage. And that percentage you typically want like over 
uh, 30% is like a really good ratio. So that's just kind of back of the napkin that says, Hey, you know, this, this could be profitable. Anything under like 20, it's going to be, um, maybe you're buying it for other reasons. Maybe you already have it. Uh, it's more like, it's not something you should chase necessarily. It's just something that, that maybe you have it to be next to grandma, or maybe you have it, uh, it was your first property or whatever, but um, that's how you kind of make that back in the napkin decision decision. So, but, but but that's number one, right? That's the first thing you're identifying your market. Then next thing you're going to build your, your team, your boots on the ground team. So you're going to need cleaners. You're going to need handymen. Um, you already have a loan on it. So you don't need to find a lender. You already don't need to find the real estate agent to find the deal. Cause you already have the deal, but those are kind of like your core, your core boots on the ground team. And then maybe, um, once you have that, and, you know, as a real estate investor, you're going to understand this. You want them all to be real estate investor friendly. So like they'll, they'll send you video of the property. They'll walk the property after like the handyman will do some work. And then maybe the cleaners are in there cleaning and will they take video of the handyman's work for you? You know, just checks and balances kind of thing. Um, that's, so then you build your team and then of course you're going to, you want to start, you want to, uh, either rehab in your case, they're, they're probably all rehab, but you, you probably want to, um, make it vacation rental friendly. And so that might mean theming it. That might mean decorating it different, different amenities, uh, free Wi-Fi, like movie channels, all, all that stuff that people want to see there. Like we've seen guys do massive, like life-size chess boards out on the, in the backyard to, you know, all sorts of different game stuff. We put theaters, we've converted like, uh, the garage into a theater. <laughs> it was a, a legitimate, like, looks like a legitimate theater with a massive screen and everything. It, was, it turned out awesome with felt walls and big posters of Disney, you know, characters. And stuff. it was awesome. Um, there's game rooms, like you, you can get fun with it. Right. Um, so that's your, that's part of your investment, obviously. Um, and then on the management side, like, then you're just, you're going to get to know some of the management apps. Like we use guesty, I think. And, um, a couple others, but that help you automate like the cleaners. Like, so it notifies the cleaners, Hey, we have a guest checking out today. You need to clean it both within the next 24 hours. Cause we have another guest coming in, in 24 hours. Like it has everybody on calendar. So you're not there just texting them over and over. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of op automations apps, technology. You'll probably want to put on there. My brother's better at this, but I'm talking a lot. So, uh, like the technology, like ring cameras and like Wi-Fi thermostats. You can control the temperature of your house from anywhere in the world. So long as you have Wi-Fi, we wow. control the temperature of our pool water um, from uh, thousands of miles away. We have one in Florida and yeah, like people are always asking for the pool water to be turned up. I'm like, yeah, we can do that. Well, that's an extra 50 bucks, but you know, like, so there's a lot of, there's so many things you can automate. So there's that. And then the last piece, I think that's it. That's it. And then we just, you know, go through the management piece and then you're going to list it um on i don't know there's so many platforms now airbnb vrbo booking.com um and then there's there's apps that link all of those together so that you don't have to um you know so you, you never get a double book manage yeah yeah, yeah exactly so somebody books on vrbo it's going to block it off on airbnb and booking.com sure um sure. yep well, so yeah damn. it's absolutely doable but yeah. there's a, there's, you know, just like anything, there's a checklist you got to go down to hit all those. It looks like we um, need to do some homework. Uh, it just, <laughs> it, it seems like such an easy way to kind of dip your toe into the water. If you've already yeah. have a rental property in an area that might work, go figure out if it works, dip your toe in the water, see if you like it, try, start to build out some of those systems and then go ahead and start buying a bunch of properties. Mm -hmm. That to yeah. me, yeah. I mean, if you already have the property, it just seems so natural if it, if it fits, right. If it works, you obviously you don't want to do 10, just any property. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine something in a, in a sp specific areas probably won't work very well, but. Uh, yeah. And you know, what's cool too, is we think of vacation rentals as strictly for vacations. Yeah. But if you're near a military base, you're near a college, you're near yeah, a your big colleges. hospital. Yeah. They do really well, you know, yeah. look at the data, but a lot of them do good, do really well. Love it. So, and you'll see four to 10 times as much cash flow, depending yeah, on it's, that. it's amazing. That's amazing. I talked to some people that like you guys that have these and it's like, really just like, wow, yeah. that's, that's yeah. some, those are really big numbers and kind of amazing that that can be that profitable, but 
you know, time after time, people are telling me that. So it's got to be true. Can't be all fake. Mm. Uh, (laughs) I mean, it's not, it's not passive, right? You do have to spend a couple hours a day, right? Right. Answering emails. Like we have uh, five or six and my wife manages them all. And like she spends an hour in the morning answering emails, setting up the, you know, handyman, whatever. Like, so there is time you have to dedicate to it, but you know, that's it. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So long, once you have your system down. Yeah. Love it. Um, what's a mistake that you guys, uh, have made and how have you learned from it? Oh, Christopher, what do you think? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the recent mistake is we bought some properties last year that, uh, didn't expect the interest rates to change that fast. But, you know, if I'm being hurt, completely honest, I didn't expect the interest rates to go up as much as they did, but far more than that, I didn't expect debt to drop LTVs as much as they did. So I've been quoted like 55% LTV on some loans, which is just interesting that um, <laughs> that happened so fast. It's been a long time. I don't even know in the history of America, the Fed has raised the rate ever that fast. So it's not something we could predict necessarily. Um, and to caveat that, if you're new and listening to this, uh, we were told in 2018 not to buy real estate because mm-hmm. of X, Y, and Z. Uh, so it doesn't mean you always just need to sit on the sidelines waiting and waiting and waiting. But that was one thing where you make a mistake, you learn, you pivot, and you uh, change your investing strategy and you keep moving forward. But taking the action and getting that property has only empowered us to learn lessons and become much th- that much better. So mistakes are really just, you know, bumps on the road to success and uh that's how you learn too that's how you grow and uh see what you like so yeah i couldn't agree more and the, the, the rates i mean hindsight's 2020 20, right and now people are like oh why of course you could have seen that coming well yeah i think everybody saw a rate hike coming mm-hmm. but i don't think anybody if you're truly being honest with yourself saw rates going up as quickly as they did And as much as they did, all the national, you know, everybody that was all over the media was, if you would have, if you would have went by what everybody was saying, rates are going to go up by like 200 to maybe 250 basis points over, you know, a 12 month period of time. Not what they did. I mean, they skyrocketed so quick, so high. It was just like, man, I, I, yeah, hindsight's 2020, but you know, the, the, th- the thing that we look at too is if you locked in long-term debt in over the past decade, you were actually, that was a, that was a bad choice. You were making <laughs> bad choices by right. locking in long-term debt and, and you lost every single time. And you were saying, oh, interest rates are going to go up. You lost every time. Yeah. And so, you know, and now you look at it and go, okay. I want to lock in long-term debt. (laughs) You know, we just locked in long-term debt for Mm 5.6%. It feels good, but my guess is we're probably going to lose, right? We're probably going to lose. We probably should have done short-term debt because likely interest rates are going to go down, but we don't know. They might be 7%, you know, all of a sudden. So who knows? (laughs) Hard to say, right? Um, I mean, what what do they say, right? It's like the best time to invest was what, 2015? years ago the second yeah. best times right right now like right when, you know right. so yeah yeah um all right so last couple questions I, we need to wrap up but uh, what's a favorite book you guys i want each of you to give me a, a favorite book or something you're reading you know now or recently that you can recommend to our listeners yeah I, for me i've been uh i keep going back to untethered life um so it's by the guy that wrote surrender experiment that's kind of the one that got him famous. I can't remember the name though. Um, it's probably Michael Singer. Yeah, Michael Singer. It's right behind yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's got an amazing story for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs too. So. Yeah, it, really cool story. The Surrender Experiment is really good if you haven't read that. Uh, talks a lot about more business and how he got started and how he used different spiritual practices that really empowered his business, which is a, it's a really cool story. And he like made a billion dollar business and all this kind of stuff. But Untethered Life's a lot about um putting in good practices to kind of like uh live a a less stressful life and also kind of um you know find a 
find happiness in your day-to-day day-to-day existence instead of kind of like living in past moments or past experiences that that have already gone by but we often think of them constantly and keep them alive in our existence and uh it doesn't really do anything but cause us grief so i I really like that book though it's good cool yeah it was a good book um i'm a avid audible listener so i i go through books quite quick um but some of my one of my all-time favorites lately has been the way of the superior man and it's an older book, I think. Um, but, and these are all self-development books, I think you'd call yeah. them maybe, or I don't know, mindset books. Um, but I think that one, it was, it, it really struck me as uh, very raw and very honest, very transparent into the way, you know, men think and operate in, in that he talks about stuff we don't even talk about with each other as men and um, why that stuff comes up. And I thought it was just really interesting, both interacting with my wife and then other men, of course, um, because every man out there wants to feel empowered. Like we seek respect. We, we demand, like, that's why we go after stuff. Right. Um, And historically, that's also why we live shorter lives, but it's also why we clash so much with our women, you know, Um, because they want love. And then we want we're, we're mission focused, whereas they're yep. more nurturing and love focused. And we're like, why don't you understand why I have to go to work all the time? And she's like, why don't you just love me? And I'm like, <laughs> um, and I, I, it just resonated a lot with me. I spending 21 years in the military, I can tell you, like, it was a huge struggle for me coming back from every deployment, everything I've ever done. Um, you know, we did some amazing stuff over there, rescuing Americans and, and just, you know, amazing stuff together. And then you come home and my, my wife, she doesn't care. She wants me to go get milk or pick up the kids, you know? Yep. And I'm like, do you know who I am? You know, like that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it's just a really good book, a really raw and, and really honest book for men. I think, um, both on how we function as men and how we can interact and be, be really be there and help our women, our, our wives and our kids. I um, love it. Love it. I have to check that one out. Uh, cause man, that what you said is so true. So <laughs> <laughs> have to check that out. Yeah. Uh, Ashton, yeah. I'm going to have you go first on this one. What are your three pillars of wealth creation? Three pillars of wealth creation. First one's going to be mindset. Um, I like to call it millionaire mindset or the CEO mindset. It's the who, not how, right? And that's also a great book. If you're looking for a book on that kind of topic, but it, it, that's essentially it. It's the who, not how, you know, I think a lot of us get wrapped up in that. Um, we have to do everything ourselves. But the CEO mindset is who do I need to talk to? Or the millionaire mindset is who do I need to invest in or work, learn from or work with to, to get what I want? Um, and then for this is for wealth creation, right? Not yeah. just three pillars yeah. of wealth creation. Okay. Yeah. So wealth creation, the second piece there. So the first one's mindset. The second piece is actually, it kind of goes in, in line with that, but it's um, we always, we're always focused on finding the way to create wealth instead of finding out who we need to be to create wealth, right? Um, who do I need to resonate with? Who do I need to become with? Like if I'm always focused on how little I have, little opportunities, little money, whatever, I am literally closing off my brain to other opportunities coming into my circle, into my experience, right? And I could go into the science of that. I'm huge into the psychology of this stuff. Um, but I think that's so integral to success in anything, right? When we say we can't do it, we can't, you know, whatever, like you're closing yourself off to everything. Um, so who do I need to become to take myself to the next level of wealth, whatever that is. Um, and then the last one is have fun because if you're not having fun, then, you know, I don't know. I, I usually cuss when I say, but what the F are you doing? Like, what's the point? You know, you think you want more money because you think it's going to make you happy. Right. But what if you could just focus on being happy now and then the journey's fun already, right? And I'm not telling you to be happy in your poverty. I'm telling you to be happy with the progress, be happy with the journey. Um, I can tell you going through some of the hardest stuff in the military, like face down in the mud and bullets flying. And like, I enjoyed it. I had a blast. I, it's it's crazy to say, but it was an adventure. It's an adventure. And when it, you look at it like that, all of a sudden, everything you're doing, no matter up or down, it's just part of the experience, right? And what does uh, Jordan Peterson say? I mean, you're all in. This life is going to kill you so- sooner or later, you know? Might mm-hmm. as well have fun with it, 
So, um, yeah, that's, those are my three mindset. Who do you need to become and then have fun with it? Yeah, those are good. Chris, man, you gotta, you gotta yeah, step, um, step up the game a little see, bit. See, how do I how do I beat that? I mean, that's yeah. pretty good stuff. Um, I think I'm probably more logical, so I get to Much the more. analytical <laughs> side of it. Um, but I'm becoming more and more, <laughs> you know, like through masterminds and different teams, I'm seeing the value of the other the other angles. But I would say, yeah, starting out with the goal, starting out with what you're what you're trying to achieve as far as wealth or happiness in general. We're all just trying to be happy. Um, so wealth is supposed to get you there to some degree. So that's why we're chasing wealth. Uh, so yeah, what is your goal and does it have a timeline and all those kind of things that go into building it? Um, and then who's going to support you to get there would be like the second one. So that's, we're big on team, but support could be your wife. It could be your family. It could be your health because you're healthy. That supports your goal. Uh, it could be, um, you know, your, your friends, all these things, you know, make sure you have the right support system in place. Make sure you put in the right team in place. It goes all together, all together to support that goal. And then, uh, yeah, taking action really is the third one, I would say, because uh, building that wealth does not necessarily happen on its own. So you getting out there and regardless of what happens, like I just said, if you mess up, Keep going, create a new goal, make that action, Take keep taking action every day um, with the right support and the right team. And uh, you'll get to that that wealth, that goal, that whatever you're trying to achieve, but don't stop taking action. <laughs> you know, don't get scared along the way. Yeah, so many people think for some reason, they think that building wealth just happens on its yeah. own. And I don't think people would necessarily think it like that, but they just, like you said, you got to take action. I know so many people that take all the courses, all the, you know, you, you said it earlier, you guys built this course. You realize that people need that like push, right? Mm -hmm. That you could have this course. It's, I'm sure your course is amazing, but an amazing course does nothing if you don't take action with it, right? Yeah. you got to get through the course, but not only do you have to get through the course, but then you have to take action on what was said in the course and what was done in the that? course. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, let's push you through. You yeah. can't get results without the action. It's it's amazing. I know people like are shocked by hearing that, but it's just how it is. Yeah. Well, here's the reality though. When you say it's just given, it's easier for some people, it puts you out of the driver's seat and now you have no responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that's a huge problem, you know, with a lot of people is they don't want to take responsibility for their own success or their own failures. Yeah. Um, but that's part of it, right? Like this is up to you. You know, no one else is coming. When you think it's easier <laughs> for somebody, are you sure? Like, did you peek behind the curtain? Do you yeah, really yeah. understand what's going on? Do you really start understand the trials and tribulations they've went to? Do you even know what they're going through right now? Like, even yeah. though it looks like they're successful on the, on the surface, are you sure they are? Or are they struggling some way, somehow? Because there's probably a lot more than you, that you don't know than what you do know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Love it, guys. Uh, look, really appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Uh, I've got a lot more questions I could ask, but we do have to wrap up. So uh, the last question I do have is how can people get in touch with you? They uh, kind of learn more about what you guys got going on. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. You can book a call with me and, and we can just chat 15 minutes, see what you're up to and connect. So I like doing that now. I don't necessarily uh, like making it a big deal or ask you for anything and just connect on LinkedIn. Um, also, our, we have a website, valkyriegroup.com. So V-A-L-K-E-R-E group.com. You can connect there as well. You can check out our blog or podcast and uh, join our investor club. It's all right there on the website. So love it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, really appreciate it. Um, appreciate all the, all the insight that you're able to give us. And uh, you guys both have a fantastic rest of the day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, so I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. It's a rating and review. Just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So 
Uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com, and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.